Welcome to the Mobile Mongrel Podcast, where we go behind the scenes in the cheese world to chat with the people making, selling, or distributing your favorite specialty food products. I'm your host, Janae Muha, certified cheese professional, longtime cheesemonger, and producer advocate. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a huge spike in the popularity of cheese plates. Throughout the pandemic, companies popped up in cities across the United States. Milkmaid Catering wasn't a pandemic business, but Megan Lewis has been able to ride that popularity to success beyond what she ever thought possible in Fargo, North Dakota. Megan gets transparent about the requirements of starting her business and the difficulties of a burgeoning business and a new family. Here's Megan's story. My name is Megan Lewis, and I am the owner and cheesemonger at Milkmaid Catering out of Fargo, North Dakota. Um, my journey to cheese is a wild one, but I think a lot of people's a lot of people's journey to cheese is, and that's so fun. Um, I originally went to school to be a music teacher, and I just realized right away that I never wanted to teach music. And so, I'm like, I think it's so stupid. At 18, they try to make you decide what you want to do with your life. Like, it's just asinine to me. And I like look at my little my kids, and I'm like, oh honey, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do at that age. No one does. Um, and so anyways, I dropped out of um, a four-year college, much to my mom's dismay, and I went to culinary school. And I went to culinary school, but I knew I never wanted to work a line. Um, I wanted to make food look good. That was my dream. I wanted to be a food stylist. I had this dream of moving to New York or Chicago. Um, and then I met a cute guy and I never left, like tail as old as time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so like throughout that, then, you know, I ran a kind of a private chefing catering company for a little bit out of my hometown, Um, got married, moved to Fargo full time. And there wasn't a space like I couldn't afford to do catering. Um, And so I went back to my first love, which is retail. I think a lot of people have done their time in retail. Um, I actually sold bridal gowns for like five years. I was a bridal consultant. Um, and then when I was ready to have kids, I didn't want to work retail hours anymore. So I actually designed people's kitchens and baths for a while. Um, and it was at that point in time that I got poached um, to go work at a boutique shop downtown Fargo um, that sold olive oils and balsamics. But they hired me on to bring on high-end grocery and to start a cheese program. So um, that was kind of a journey. I always tell people that's a random journey. Uh, but I always was making things look their best right? If you were getting married, I was making you look your best. You're designing your kitchen and your bath. I was ma- Aesthetically, I just love making things look beautiful. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a very long journey. Um, I worked behind the counter and started their cheese program, Green. Knew absolutely nothing about cheese. Knew no one in the industry. Um, and I, you know, I was there for about two and a half years. Um, through there, I started a platter program because we weren't a restaurant. We couldn't turn and burn cheese, right? So it's kind of like, what are we going to do sometimes to move this stuff? And I started a platter program. And I say that's when my love of cheese and food styling came together and had a food baby. And that was most made. Awesome. Uh, (laughs) What year was that, that you um, started working in the shop? Yeah. So I started working with cheese in 2015, um, the fall of 2015. um, And I started at the cheese shop in September. And if that gives you any idea, we launched the cheese program in December. So I started there in September and we had less than three months to launch this cheese program. And I knew nothing. Right. For the holidays. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yep. And, um, and so it was one of those things where I think, you know, you think back to your childhood and like making friends and meeting new people didn't seem overwhelming, but like, as you get older, like making those cold calls kind of is like really super intimidating. And I remember, you know, sounds so creepy, but like stalking Instagram and Facebook and like trying to find people in the cheese industry that would take a phone call and would kind of help me with the basics. And I learned very quickly that the cheese industry is amazing. Like people were so helpful to me. Um, I was able to, you know, go work at a couple shops and kind of shadow and shadow a cheesemaker and really kind of dig in. Um, and I found that it wasn't as intimidating as I thought it was going to be. All right. I love that because I feel like even in 2015, 
where we are in terms of the cheese community on social media is a very different place. Even like we have groups on Facebook and like, right. Instagram is like a wealth of information of people. And yeah. I feel like that was just kind of starting then. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is, a, it was a little more intimidating to just be like, yeah, hey, can I come visit you now? Um, I have no qualms about being like, Hey, I'm going to be in town. Like, right. It's, it is. It's a, to- it was a totally different feeling. And I was um, really lucky that I had some really kick butt people that worked in distribution that were still some of my best friends in cheese today that were like, took me like a little birdie under my, their wing and was like, girl, let me help you. Cause you need it. And, but they weren't mean about it. You know, I did need it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I feel like it is different now, but at the time, um, yeah, it was, people were really receptive. It was amazing. And it kind of made me solidify my thought of like, this is an industry that I could be in for a really long time. I also really like the idea of you going from like bridal consulting into this because it kind of like oh. works out and I feel like it set you up in such a good way of like, you know how to talk to brides and kind of get yeah. them on your side and like, you want to order stuff for me. So, and that, that's a right? skill. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like too, you know, it was funny. Like, I feel like I've always had a little bit of a salesman mentality, like selling ice to an Eskimo. Do you know what I mean? Like, and selling bridal, I absolutely loved it because I got to learn the bride's story, right? Like I was their advocate. I mean, it's very much so like the shows you saw on TV of like, there's always a mean mom or a mean sister or a jealous bridesmaid or whatever. And so like, I always got to know the bride's story and then like advocate for her. So like, when you think about like being a cheesemonger and you think about like the storytelling that we're blessed to do for the makers, you know, like I was so used to already like really honing in on somebody's story and then like advocating that story that it, yeah, it kind of is a weird transition, but it, it worked. I love all of the random things that people have done before cheese that just kind of like work to their favor (laughs) when they're in it. (laughs) Yeah, it, it is true. And like I said, I think it's kind of, you know, it's fun to see people's journeys for yeah. sure. So let's talk about Milkmaid. When did you open Milkmaid? Yeah, I launched Milkmaid in May, May 1st of 2017. Um, and I actually launched Milkmaid thinking it was going to be, um, at the time I had a one-year-old. Well, no, sorry, Liddy would have been two. And I really needed to get out of retail. It was a very toxic environment. Um, I wasn't thriving. Um, and it was really difficult because, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people can relate. Like when you start a cheese program at a shop, like that was my whole heart and soul. Like that was like, I gave birth to that program and, you know, to, to walk away from that was really difficult. And so I was in a very negative headspace for a really long time until I finally got to the point where I was like, I love this so much, but I can't do this anymore. And so, um, you know, I kind of decided to step away and my husband's awesome. He's super supportive. And he said, you know, you really thrive when you make platters. And he's like, I think that you could do that. And I had the dream of, you know, kind of doing a catering company that was centric around cheese, but I mean, doing it in Fargo, North Dakota is kind of crazy. Uh, people, a lot of people are crazy. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things where I, um, yeah, I launched it just kind of thinking it was going to be like a stay at home mom gig. And it like very quickly became clear that I was going to be much busier than that. So that was a blessing. <laughs> but I was also pregnant my first year of business. 10 out of 10 do not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> like looking back, I'm like, how in, I don't, can we swear on this podcast? How in the hell did I do that? You know, like I look back on that and I was like, man, that was absolutely crazy. Um, So I, my first birthday of Milkmaid was May 1st and I gave birth to Clara May 13th. So I was literally pretty much pregnant my whole first year of business. Um, And then I wore her like a little kangaroo baby for like four months after. I think I had my first cater like 12 days after I gave birth to her. And then I wore her for like four months, like a little kangaroo belly on my, you know, warmer, wore on my belly um, for like those first four months of business after she was born. So. Wow. I, don't know. I, I can't even imagine. I don't have kids, but I can't even imagine like <laughs> birthing a new business and a baby all in the same amount of time. Yeah. Um, and then it was kind of, you know, at that time I was still 
balancing being a part-time mom and a part-time business owner. And the business was definitely growing at a rate that it wasn't a part-time business anymore. And so you kind of, I got into that mindset of like, how can I be a good business owner and be a good mom? And I was torn and I wasn't being great at anything. And so it was really kind of that Christmas season where I really burnt myself out big time. And I kind of sat down and I really realized like, I have to commit to this business. If I don't, how am I, how am I ever going to see its potential? And so that January, we decided to, you know, send both of our kids to daycare full time, which is so expensive, you know, when you're starting a business and it was scary. And, um, but that year, so that would have been 2019, that year, Milkmaid saw 200% growth, um, just because I was able to commit to it. And I wasn't, you know, trying to juggle all the other things in life. Um, so that was a scary decision for the business, but I'm so glad that I did. Uh, sounds like starting a platter company in Fargo, North Dakota, doesn't sound as crazy as you thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, it's hilarious. I tell people all the time, like I totally underestimated how much people love cheese. Like, why do I do that? Like I just, I did. I mean, I think it's like a self-conscious thing, right? Like you're launching this business. The concept's a little bit crazy for the area that you're in. And, you know, I was like, oh, I just, I really underestimated how much people love cheese. But also like the whole first, gosh, almost two years of my business was just advocating for artisan cheese and like educating people about it. You know, it wasn't really until, you know, a couple years into my business that I wasn't defending my business model, wasn't defending you know, I run an incubator business model, which is different. I don't have a storefront, you know? So kind of once I started to get that clientele and I started steamrolling a little bit, I don't have to defend it anymore, which is like so nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not good when you're trying to just defend your business and you shouldn't have yeah. to, you're incredibly talented. Oh, thank you. I also feel like you really kind of got in at the right time too, where we really saw that kind of like you know, obviously cheese shops around the country have been doing platters forever, but over the last, especially five years, it's just kind of went. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that's so true. And like, it was just, yeah, it it is crazy. You know, I think like a lot of people in the cheese industry, when I started at um, that cheese boutique and I was kind of looking at a platter program, you know, Lilith Spencer at that time was like, just elevating cheese boards to like a whole level. And like, I cannot tell you how much I fangirled on her. Like it, her platter still to this day just like absolutely blow my mind. And I just felt so inspired by that, that, um, you know, so once we started Milkmaid, it was kind of taking that inspiration, almost of like mandala, like qualities of cheese platters. But we really had to figure out how to scale and grow that. Um, you know, like for an example, like for Thanksgiving last year, we put out, you know, like 65 platters in a day. So you kind of have to figure out how to take that, that beauty. And I would absolutely love to take the time that I would need to make every single platter look that way. Um, but we kind of had to learn how to, how to kind of scale that. And, you know, so we can kind of mass produce, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we totally got in at the right time. I think, the, like I said, the first couple of years was like a lot of, you know, defense education, you know, why is that so important? And then you totally got that younger generation that started loving the idea of like charcuterie boards and platters and all these beautiful inspirations on Instagram and now TikTok. And yeah, so I mean, I think we, we got in at the right time and we kind of rode that wave a little bit. And we do a ton of classes in education. So like we have that as a huge part of our business of like kind of taking those people that like want to learn more about the process and like teaching them how to do it, which has been, you know, riding that wave too. So let's talk components of Milkmaid. Like what, um, what kind of components do you need to run your business? Like you said, you're in your commercial kitchen right now. Um, yeah. And also kind of what do the laws look like in North Dakota? Because you know, in Washington, um, cutting cheese is not part of the cottage industry. So you can't just do it in your house. You have to have a commercial kitchen. So I just kind of want to get into some of those details. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such an awesome question. I don't get asked that very often. Um, so in North Dakota, we do have cottage law. Um, but right away from the very beginning, I knew that cheese and charcuterie didn't fall under cottage law. And so, 
Um, we're really blessed in Fargo to have this amazing incubator kitchen space called Square One Kitchen. Um, it's, so right now I think there's close to 40 businesses that operate out of here. Um, food trucks, uh, bakers, you know, kind of, we have an artist, artisan hot sauce maker. Um, and so it's pretty nice. It, and then four businesses can be operating out of here at the same time. You access, you book time online. I can be in here 24 seven if I need to. Um, and that really was, I think, the main component in being able to start this business is I didn't have to have a brick and mortar and I really could keep my overhead really low. Um, so we were really blessed that I had that opportunity right away. Um, so yeah, in North Dakota, I have to work, do everything out of a commercial uh, kitchen space. Um, also to like, we are very heavily health inspected, um, due to just some of the nature ounce of cheese products and dry cured meats, which I just joke because like Marianne down the road can like make botulin filled salsa, but like nobody's watching her. <laughs> oh, I have things you to know, say about that for sure. I like... <laughs> know. It just is like, so it just blows my mind. Um, so yeah, North Dakota, you do have to be covered that way. Um, and I think that sometimes too, you know, you see this trend of a lot of people making cheese boards for a living, but they're not actually necessarily following those regulations and those safety measures um, to be doing that. And so, yeah, if you're looking into starting a platter business, make sure you know your cottage laws and know what, did it, what your regulations are in the state. And then, you know, that can be sometimes, like I said, not everybody has a commercial kitchen opportunity like I do. Um, but yeah, so in North Dakota, it is it is a little bit trickier to be able to do what I do. Um, but I've been doing it out of the kitchen since I started. Do you have to get licensed at all? Because I know in some states you have to get licensed. And Yes, yes. So I'm fully licensed. I pay the state. Um, and then I get health inspected at least twice a year. Um, you have to have a special... Um, event licenses as well. So, um, you know, Milkmaid, we do pop-up cheese shops. We do caters for um, like wineries, breweries, those types of things. So then I have to have a specialty event license as well. Um, so yeah, it's kind of all of those things that add up to the startup of your business. And then I pay that yearly. So yeah, I think that people don't realize that too, because I know that even in <laughs> Seattle, because I've looked into it here, um, and we do have quite a few commercial kitchens and like incubate incubator kitchens and whatnot, but the ones that I've looked at to do like an hourly thing, if you're just starting out, yeah, they're hourly, but you have to have $500 worth of hours to work every, sure. like for the first month. And like, that's hard yep. to kind of say when you're just starting out and then you have to have like food licenses for every town that you might work in nearby. Oh, so sure. like it's mm -hmm. a little bit different if you're outside of like Seattle or King County and like you go to a different County and you need a different license yes. for that one. Yes. So it gets really tricky um, to maintain all of that stuff. It's a lot to, it's a lot to juggle. Yeah, I agree. And then we, you know, we in Fargo are literally right on the border of Minnesota, it's like Fargo Moorhead, it goes, you know, right over the state. And so, you know, I also have to kind of watch my behind of like Minnesota, you know, laws as well. And, um, you know, we've been health inspected for Minnesota, we've had to do different types of event licenses for different states. And so, yeah, it definitely is something that you know, worthwhile to educate yourself on and to, to kind of dot your I's and cross your T's when it comes to that type of stuff. Um, yeah. And you mean, then, you know, as a small business too, you're also, you know, having liability insurance, a certain amount of dollar of liability insurance. I have employees now, uh, um, you know, so then you're paying a payroll company and you have to have workman's comp and all these things, you know? And so as you continue to grow and kind of think of those things, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of little details you have to concern yourself with. Yeah. I, I love knowing all the fine details because I've looked into it, but it's nice to know someone who's actually done it and like is succeeding, yeah. you know? So oh, and, thank you. And every state is also a little bit different too. Mm -hmm. So yep, it, it definitely is. And I, I guess I haven't done a ton of like research into other states, but maybe there are some that are covered under cottage law. I guess I don't know. I haven't really done enough research to. There are. 
and Are that's, there? Okay. yeah so it's it is a little bit strange um because uh, like the general overarching governmental idea about cheese is that it's so dangerous and be very yes. careful and then there's some yes. states that are like whatever yeah, I know it, it is crazy. Like even like North Dakota into Minnesota, like Minnesota is probably 10 times stricter than North Dakota. So like you're kind of, you know, you feel like you're jumping back and forth and you're like, I'm really, really bad at this health and safety thing. Oh my gosh, I'm a rock star in North Dakota and I'm doing, I'm like an overachiever. And you're like, it's like emotionally exhausting. You're like, I don't know what I am. <laughs> Sometimes being in the middle is the best thing to oh. be. Yes. And as long as you know that you're being safe and like Correct. handling things properly, that's my biggest thing. Yeah, and I think sure. that having a background as a cheesemonger, even if you were fully green when you started yeah. working in like a retail food service, like that's like boot camp. Like for real. <laughs> you it learned really real was. quick. Yeah, I learned real quick. And I learned, you know, I learned a lot of lessons the hard <laughs> the hard way. Um, just meaning like, you know, when you started off so green and you're like, okay, well, I'll pick 12 cheeses that I know about, and then I'll just continue to dig deeper and learn more. And, um, yeah, it was exciting. Uh, so Fargo doesn't necessarily to me seem like a huge, like food city. Um, but what does distribution for cheese look like in that area? Yeah. I mean, the thing is with Fargo is it has come so far in the last, like, eight to six, six to eight years. It really is amazing. And my example that I give people that aren't familiar with the Fargo area is when I first moved here to go to college, we had like six Applebee's in like a very tiny area. Okay? That's exactly what I think about Fargo. Yeah, you honest. think about like Applebee's and Chili's, you know what I mean? Kind of all of these very basic microwavable chains. And um, now we have two Applebee's and a ton of really amazing local restaurants. And I think that tide has really turned um, to like supporting more local restaurants, supporting local food, um, you know, kind of that farm to table thing. I mean, we're always like a couple years behind everybody, but I feel like that's really changed. Um, and that's been really awesome for us as well. I mean, people are really looking for, you know, more artisan food, more local food, more farm fresh food. Um, so that's, that's kind of changed. Um, as far as distribution goes, you know, I'm pretty lucky that I'm fairly close to Wisconsin. Mi Minnesota's making some really kick butt cheese right now. Um, you know, Iowa isn't too crazy far. And so, um, I still like to buy things direct if I can. Um, and like another thing that really helped us out is, um, Redhead Creamer out of Bruton, they started in, during COVID, they started like doing deliveries, like town deliveries. And so Fargo is one of their, their main deliveries. And they actually got a grant to get this huge cooler system. And so they're kind of pooling a ton of cheeses from the state of Minnesota and it almost works like a wholesaler. And so that's been really great for me because then I can get all of my favorite Minnesota cheeses in one place and it gets delivered right to me. Um, but I have, to, I mean, I, Minneapolis does some good distribution for me as well. I mean, I'm able to get stuff from around the world and around the country um, through them as well. So as far as that goes, but that's come a long way too. I mean, compared to where that was five years ago, the options that I'm able to get now, um, but that's also has come through connections. I mean, that's come through me you know, meeting makers and building relationships with local makers and, you know, kind of just learning more about the landscape of the local food has really changed. And it's really exciting. North Dakota actually just opened their first artisan creamery like this fall. Aww. So it's really fun. Yeah, we didn't have any. And it's this family that um, came here from the Netherlands and they're making Gouda. Um, and it's, it's really good. I mean, it's really good cheese. So it's exciting. That's so cool. Uh, so do you focus mainly on kind of like cheeses that are from your area or like, what do you, what do you think about when you go into uh, thinking about the cheeses that you want to put on your platters? Yeah. I mean, I think it is, it's, it's a huge, um, it's a huge amount of supporting as local as possible and kind of, if I'm not going to do it, who is going to do it? And so, um, and that meant that really changed a lot for me, like going to my first ACS in Denver. I mean, it was, my mind was really blown of the amounts of cheese that America was making 
and at the quality they were making it at. And if you don't really know and you don't have that connection or like that meet the maker opportunity where you can try cheeses from all over, it was really mind blowing. And I think that really helped to change the milkmaid business model. Like I would say right now, 85% of the stuff that we put on our platters is domestic. Um, and you know, that other 15% are kind of, I don't know, I call them like the kingpin cheeses, like cheeses that you get in from, uh, you know, that you like the Montegos and the Stiltons and those types of things. Um, I don't know. I just am really impressed with American cheeses and I feel like we're just making some pick what cheese. So I just like to support it. I agree 100%. Um, so you kind of mentioned uh, with what Redhead is doing about COVID. So mm-hmm. let's kind of talk about how that affected you and your business and, you know, take yeah. me through that timeline from the beginning yeah. to kind of where we are now. Did you hear me take that big breath of like, <gasps> yeah, <"Whoa."> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of like to give you an example, like we, you know, COVID kind of really hit that middle of March was kind of, I feel like when it really just came to a head. And I think we lost close to like 20 some caters in three days. I mean, it was just like cancel after cancel after cancel. And like, talk about just panic attack, right? You're just like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And then you kind of retroflect and you're like, okay, I'm actually in a pretty blessed space. I don't have a brick and mortar. I have, you know, a couple hundred pounds of cheese in the cooler and I have a credit card to pay off. So if I can move my cheese and pay off my credit card, <laughs> I can be a sitting duck if I have to, right? I can pull my kids from daycare and I, you know, it's kind of that mindset and it was definitely like that sink or swim feeling, right? It was like either you learn to pivot or you fail. Um, and so right away I thought, okay, we do classes. We do a ton of classes. Classes solve them well for us. What if we launch like Friday night virtual classes? And so the cool thing about in North Dakota, they actually um, passed a law that allowed restaurants to do off sale. So I had a restaurant friend that we do a ton of like wine and cheese pairings and stuff together. And so we combined right away because you could off sale wine. So I could do wine, I could do beer, I could do whatever. And um, so I think our first class we did, we had like, we sold over like 65 tickets. And I think it's because one, people wanted to support local and two, they were looking for stuff to do. Um, and so we would just, you know, host pickups where it would be like no contact and people would come pick up their kit. Um, and so we just like a Friday pairing class for almost two and a half months, like consistently every Friday, we did like chocolate and cheese, cider and cheese, beer versus wine with cheese, you know, and then you just get burnt out. Like we got so burnt out. Cause like that creativity of, constantly coming up with those classes and then having that like quick turnaround of trying to do that weekly um man that bird does that really fast and so I mean then we started doing like mini platter pickup days and you know just trying to become creative I think like May Day we sold like over 175 mini platters because people like wanted to do May Day again. They're like, this is so exciting. We can just drop this at their door and ring the bell and like run away. It was kind of funny to see like what was popular and what wasn't. Um, and then, you know, but COVID wasn't always negative, right? I tend to be a glass half full person. And the kind of the positivity for that was we were mobile and we, you know, and so we could, we could really work with people in a different way. And we did a ton of galas for nonprofits. That was huge for us. Um, and most of the time, you know, they'd go to a hotel and kind of eat, you know, cruddy hotel hors d'oeuvres and be in a ballroom and whatever. And so a lot of nonprofits, you know, offered cheese platters to go for like their virtual, their galas and fundraisers. And I mean, so we did like hundreds of cheese platters for galas and stuff that opportunity would have never come to us. And now we have, you know, a larger portfolio of corporate clients. Um, and then last holiday season, I mean, We ship cheese platter kits all over the country. We did, um, Microsoft has a huge campus in Fargo. Bobcat has a huge campus in Fargo. And so a lot of these big corporations were trying to figure out what to do for client interactions like Christmas parties. Um, And so, yeah, we ship cheese platters all over the country, like cheese platter kits. And then I would teach a virtual Zoom class. Um, So we just pivoted, you know, We, we tried our best and, and um, once the vaccine came out in March, I mean, it, we've been steamrolled. 
since March. And I think it's just because, you know, kind of people's mindset, at least around here is like, we don't know when this time is going to be taken away from us again. So if we close down or something like that has to happen, we want to fit in all the parties we can. Um, and so, yeah, we've just been completely steamrolled just with larger caters now. Like I don't like during COVID, I was like, God, I just want to make my main event. Like I just want to make my 50 person platter. Like I so miss making these big, beautiful things. I'm so sick of mini platters. Um, and then I, then like in one week I had like 12 main events and I'm like, okay, it's, it's okay. Karma. I'm done. I don't need to make, I don't need to make them anymore. <laughs> you get what you ask for. Megan. I know it is so true. Um, but I mean, we've been really blessed. I mean, we've, we've come out of it, um, stronger, which is good. Not everybody can tell the same story. So we're very, um, we were blessed of kind of where the type of business we were running. Um, we could be a setting duck if we needed to. Yeah. Um, and one of those main events I saw recently that you posted on uh, Facebook or Instagram about a 300 pound oh order. Gosh, like, I, tell, tell me about this. I want to know. It was insane. Um, so we had um, a person in Fargo who owned like a sports team that had passed away, unfortunately. And they were having a celebration of life and they had expected 2,500 people at the celebration of life. And so they um, contracted us to do a grazing table for 2,500 people. Um, and we had five days. Um, <laughs> you know, that was probably, I think, what, what did I learn from that experience? I learned that all of the connections that I've worked so hard to make in the last five years paid off because we pulled it off. I was able to get, you know, 400 pounds of cheese in two days. And I was able to find a company to make me the 75 fresh baguettes that I could pick up that morning. And, you know, the charcuterie I could find, you know, the quality and the quantity to need. I mean, when you're talking that, it's not even a question of like, if you have it, it's do you have enough for me? Like that's, I mean, it was incredible, um, you know, and I had just the biggest support system of friends who like came in and just like cut grapes for me for hours and like, <laughs> you know, um, but we did it. We pulled off 30 feet of grazing table in five days um, and it was awesome. And so, yeah, I mean, opportunities like that, right? Like when you start a business, you're like, I just hope that somebody wants a platter. I hope just like one person wants to buy a platter from me. And then five minutes, you know, five, five minutes here, right? Five years later, you know, then we're doing something of that caliber. And it was just, it was absolutely crazy. I would love a little peek into your project management brain during that whole time period. Cause that sounds pretty yeah. wild. It was wild. And I think had it been, you know, within that five days, it's almost like it was just pure adrenaline. Like the moment you booked it to the moment of the end, it was just like, all of the logistics had to come together like that. But the hardest thing was about it, honestly, is like I was able to get the majority of the stuff in within, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And then you're just sitting on it for three days and you can't do anything. That was probably the worst part of like those three days of like that 12 hour prep day, just like looming over you. And you're like, God, I just want to do it. Can we just do it already? Um, yeah, so we prepped 12 hours the day before and then we served for... 12 again so it was about a 24 hour event from start to finish um wow. I still need sleep I think <laughs> <laughs> probably I would imagine <laughs> oh man so what's next for I mean where where are you at what are you doing like yeah what, what are you uh what are you working on you know, I think another thing that Milkmaid started doing during COVID is we, you know, became a mobile pop-up shop, which really changed a lot of stuff for us. We have a super active farmer's market that often gets like three to 5,000 people through on a Saturday. Um, and we started selling, you know, bulk cheeses, um, charcuterie, nuts, chocolate. And then we partnered with a local bread maker to like sell artisan breads to go with it. And that's been absolutely humongous for us and so this and then holiday season I mean I think anybody in retail just feels that um you know I think like I said last year for Thanksgiving we put out like 65 platters in a day 
Um, so we have, you know, the two days before Christmas and the day before Thanksgiving, like all other tea shops in the country are, are pretty much our busiest days of the year. Um, we have those coming up. Uh, but as far as like Milkmaid as a company, um, I got a little crazy last year and I purchased um, a 1977 vintage Forester camper uh, that I named Bessie and she is in the current state of remodel um, to be a mobile cheese shop slash um, cater mobile. Um, you get to a point where like you go to you know every event and they say well where can I buy cheese and you want to scream well from me but I'm not a brick and mortar right and so you kind of get to the point of like how do you go to the customer when the customer wants you? Um, and so I think that's going to be a huge, that'll be a huge thing for us once hopefully Bessie is ready in 2022. Um, you know, COVID kind of steamrolled that whole situation. Um, but yeah, I think that's the whole thing of Milkmaid. Everything that we've done, we've done really organically, meaning like we let the customer request what they wanted. And then we figured out if it was, feasible for us to do it um and then we we watched things I think pretty um I think it was all that trauma of like launching the first cheese case in three months and it just felt like you were never ready and then you were just constantly jogging to like keep up like that whole like traumatic experience has made me be like okay let's prepare before we just you know jump into something new um so yeah I mean we started doing cones I know you have some experience <laughs> with mm -hmm. cones um we want we launched those last fall during COVID and honestly those things are just absolutely ridiculously popular for us I oh, mean I can I imagine can't at even, the farmer's market oh my gosh I can't even tell you how many of these cones I've picked in the last year um they've been so popular for like bridal showers baby showers weddings corporate events I mean like I think next Thursday we have almost 300 of them going out between different corporate events that are doing like open houses or Christmas parties or whatever. Um, and we named them very Norwegian. It's Oh for Cutery Cone. Um, <laughs> because if you've ever been to the Midwest, everybody says Oh for whatever. So Oh for Cute. Those are so cute. Oh for Cute. Um, so we kind of hate ourselves for that name, but people absolutely love it. So it's for the people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well I love all of that I think it sounds great I'm really excited to see Bessie and like you know you're gonna cruise her out to Portland next year I hope so I, yeah hell yeah she's gonna be so funny I mean I don't I, I don't know if I don't know how many people in the cheese world know of Milk Me, but I absolutely love we've created these like stupid funny characters like I have a cheese girl and a cheese boy that say like, I want to grow mold with you. And I have like figs that high five that say like, you're big enough. And like, I just, I just love these quirky things. And so you better believe those are going to be like, the whole trailer is just going to be wrapped in these like, you know, outrageous people. And yeah. Fun, 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 fun. fun. All right. I got the speed round. Oh, okay. Ready for it. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Current cheese crush. Um, I, I've tried Prairie Harvest from Milton Creamery and it is so tasty. Um, I just got to try that. And so we sell Prairie Breeze and their caramelized onion cheddar like you wouldn't believe. And I'm excited to be able to offer something new that's really tasty from them. Awesome. Favorite pairing? Um, Milkmaid did a Girl Scout cookies and cheese. And my favorite pairing that I've ever done is like their lemon cello Girl Scout cookie with Purple haze, their fennel pollen and lavender goat smoke cheese from Cypress Grove. It was really good. Oh, that sounds delightful. Really like, good. Lemony and herb. It was like oh, yeah. The shortbread with the herb and like the, oh, God, it was so good. I think about it all the time. Yeah, that sounds perfect, actually. Yeah, it was so good. <laughs> Uh, best cheese memory and that can be you don't actually have to be eating cheese in this uh -huh. memory but just something that really stands out to you in your head with cheese people eating cheese yeah could be from childhood or whenever. yeah okay here's my favorite cheese story so I always thought about when did I start loving cheese um when I was probably four or five my parents owned a hardware store and you know the cash wraps that have like all the candy and the beef jerky and all that type of stuff, like think small town, Ace Hardware type of thing. And I remember 
when the first time I had that inkling that like, I really want something, but my parents said no, but I'm going to do it anyways. And I didn't steal a chocolate bar. I stole like a beef stick and cheese stick combo pack that you get at like all the gas stations. And I like ran away like an evil little person into like the, the stock room. And like my mom found me eating this like beef and cheese stick, like behind a cardboard box in a storage room. And I feel like that's so telling of my whole life. Like I just have been obsessed with this, like meat and cheese forever. And like my mom used to so laugh about that story of like, she should have known I was going to do something like this because I didn't ever steal like gum or a candy bar. Like I got to steal the meat and cheese and I got to run. So my mom doesn't find it. That's probably my best one. I was hoping it, you were going to say the like combo meat and cheese sticks. Cause oh, yeah, it wasn't just the one. It was like the combo <laughs> that you ate together. It was so good. <laughs> I still get some sometimes because I just think they're like nostalgia, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, is there anything that we didn't cover that you want people to know about Milkmaid? Anything oh. else you have to say? No, I mean, I think maybe if I could give a piece of advice to anybody sure. who like Absolutely. wants to maybe look into doing, you know, an avenue of doing like platters and things um, for a living, like they're ready to kind of maybe choose a new career in cheese that's not, you know, the typical realm of it. Um, I think my biggest advice would be is if you're starting to do a cheese platter program, like make sure that you're really true to your brand like, because nobody's going to represent it like you will, right? And so, like, create something that you feel really, really good about. Like, I remember when I first started, I thought it had to be, like, kind of elegant and, like, had to have, like, a cow and a sheep and a goat and it had to be very serious. And I was working with a designer on my brand and I had this idea for all these kind of quirky, really approachable branding and characters and he was like, why are you trying to be something that you're not? Like, that's not who you are. And I'm actually really glad that I've done it. I've had, you know, it's fun to see people laugh and smile when they see their branding, but also it made me more approachable. It wasn't so like pretentious looking or didn't feel like you couldn't approach it. And so I love that. But also too, like stand by what you're doing. You know, when we first started and we had a bunch of people, I mean, living in the Midwest were like, um, yeah, I guess I'll try a cheese and charcuterie platter, but I also want some Spanish meatballs and some spinach and artichoke dip and can you set up like a lemonade and a coffee thing and you know in your mind you're thinking well damn do I, I have the capacity right do I do that and then you have to stick with your gut and be like no because that's not what you are like we just offer cheese and charcuterie antipasti fruit and veggie and bread and crackers that's it it's very clean we offer nine platters that's it and I'm so glad in those early days I stuck to that and I said no so many times because now people look to us for those specific things. And so I think my biggest advice is if you're looking to take the leap and to start your own business is make a brand that's true to you and stick to what you're good at because your customers will find you. If you provide awesome customer service, you're selling an amazing, if you're buying quality products and you're putting your whole self into it, the right customers will find you. Um, I've had so many people who are starting a business that feel so down about that. And it's just, you have to trust yourself to give it time. It's not gonna, you know, you're not gonna make millions of dollars. I still don't, I never will. And that's great, I don't want to. Um, Very few of us in the cheese world are, so there's Yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> and that's, it's, you're, in a, you're in a career for the passion of it. Um, you know, more so than this is going to make me. Well, and I also think it's an important thing to think about that. We can't be everything to everyone. So why try like, know what you're good at, stick with that and focus on that. And then it, yeah. I feel like do, having a more focused idea of it yeah. all is really important and do, and do a kick-ass job with it. Like show all the people that doubted you from the very beginning that, like pe people love cheese people want this and I, I mean coming from you know a town of you know only 300,000 people like to run a successful business like this like people want good food products and they want it to be presented beautifully and they want to know that it was made with love and I think that's why Milkmaid has been you know tra tracking successfully for as long as we have been. Yeah. I also think too, that 
you give the aesthetics and elegance while also being approachable and fun. And that's cute. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, like I told a story, I actually did a little live video for a giveaway thing this morning. And I told the story of, I have never, I probably have been called the cheese lady more than I've been called my name in public for the last like two and a half years. And you kind of forget like Milkmaid hasn't spent a dollar in advertising. So it's all of me just putting myself out there often looking like an idiot on social media because I think people want real people. Like they don't want it to be a perfect package. It's not who I am at all. Oftentimes I'm like hair up, gross and sweaty, been in the kitchen all day, but it's real. And so I, uh, this summer I was at Costco and I was real grungy, like day off. And I was buying one of those huge, you know what like a lily pad is for like a lake? Like a, it's like a big flotation device mm-hmm. thing. They're yeah. huge. So I was buying one for my kids for the lake. And I'm the type of person that was like, I am not going all the way back to the front to get a cart. I'm going to make this work. And so I was trying to shove this like hundred of pound lily pad into a regular Costco cart. And there was this adorable couple. They had, you know, a little kid and this gentleman came up to me and he said, hey, do you need a hand with that? Very Midwestern, very nice. And his wife was like, oh my God, it's the cheese lady. Honey, it's the cheese lady. I follow her on Instagram. Oh my God, we're helping the cheese lady put her lily pad in her cart. This is so exciting. And I was like, first of all, I am not a slick local celebrity. I am just one hot mess mom just hoping to make money. <laughs> oh, but she's funny. But it's, it's so humbling to be, you know, just to have people that are excited about your business and want to get to know you because you put yourself out there authentically and you hope that people um, will respond. And when they do, it's, it's fun. It's really fun. That's awesome you're the local celebrity at the Costco <laughs> I guess I mean if you want to see an idiot at Costco trying to put a lily pad into her cart that's me I'm there for you I'm here for it <laughs> all right well thank you so much Megan and uh, I appreciate getting a little more of a glimpse into what you're creating there and I am so stoked to see more yes well thank you so much for having me this was so fun and I thoroughly enjoy looking at your success as well Megan's authenticity and silliness shines through in everything that she does. It's how she's able to connect with her clientele on a deeper level so they trust what she's bringing to the table. Thank you, Megan, for giving me a glimpse into your world, and I'm excited to see where it goes. This podcast is recorded, produced, and edited by me, Janae Muha. Thank you to Ben Muha for allowing me to use your music. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow along on my cheesy adventures at Instagram and Facebook. I post full video recordings over on Patreon and would love to hear about topics or people you think need the spotlight. Thanks for listening. And remember to keep spreading the word of good courage.